exciting. Um, so our next presenter is Professor Paul Miller. He is the instructor of, I have the official title here, the instructor of media studies and the communications program coordinator here at Central Penn. And I don't know if a lot of you know this, but he recently applied to a doctorate program. He got accepted, so that's exciting. <laughs> So Professor Miller also had to hand in a research paper. So students out there, professors have to do research too. So they know you're suffering. So he had to do a research assignment to hand in for his application. Um, and I was lucky enough to get to read it and help him a little bit, so that was a lot of fun. And this paper was on social media echo chambers. So we're going to talk about that today. But first, we have two scholarships to give out. I think both of the students are here. So whenever I call your name, just come up and we're going to get a photo. So the first one is Tyler Coleman. The second one is Bridget McCarthy. And Professor Miller, you're going to be in the picture too. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations, I'll uh, share a little bit with them. Uh, uh, about why I selected them. And first of all, Samantha, you're way too kind. Both yourself and Professor Davis were instrumental in me doing this writing sample. Um, just a little bit more background with where this came from. I really need to thank my nightly news club members for the inspiration for doing this because this was actually what we did as a group as part of the research exhibition last year. Um, we did this exact topic, and it was something that a lot of the people on this campus really gravitated to, and we actually did very well. We won second place, and we actually won the fan favorite. And so whenever I started, when I applied to uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania for my PhD, I had to do a writing sample. Um, I haven't written... Look, I write all the time. I write for different companies. I write for the nightly news. I write for, you know giving feedback to my students. I'm constantly writing, but I haven't done anything long form in a very, very, very long time. So when I was told that I had to do a writing sample, it was something that I really wanted to make sure was something that I was very interested in. And so that's really where the, this idea for this topic came from. Um, but I do want to thank my club members for helping, helping me in a, in a certain way, because I actually use a lot of the sources that we used in our uh, research exhibition. Um, what we're going to talk about today is something called the social media echo chamber. Some of you might not be necessarily familiar with this, so we're going to kind of start way back at the beginning. But before I do that, I do want to give a quick shout out again to Tyler and to Bridget. Um, Tyler is a predominantly online student, but recently has uh, started coming to campus for some evening classes. And Tyler has really stepped up, not only with working you know, with some of our other students, but he's also going to be one of our, our broadcasters for our sports initiative when we call the baseball games coming up. So he's going to be one of those people, if you tune into these baseball games, that you'll be able to check out. And Tyler, is, I give him a ton of credit. Bridget, I've had the opportunity to have her in class several times. She's wonderful in class, always starts great discussions. So if you guys don't mind, just maybe one more quick round of applause for them. I really appreciate that. So to talk about the social media echo chamber, it's important for me to kind of go back to the beginning of how the internet was created and why we're kind of in this situation that we are all in. Because the one thing I can tell you all right now is that we are all, every single person sitting in this room, we are all a part of this. We are all part of creating our own echo chambers. And, and we'll talk about what that is and we'll talk about why that is. Um, so we're going to talk about that. But really what we're going to talk about is, and the reason that this is happening, 
is due to algorithms that are put forth in our social media channels. I want to make a preface by saying this. I'm going to use the word Facebook a lot. Uh, I'm using that because that is the most predominant social media with the most users. But I do want to point out that the, the synonym social media can be put into Facebook because Facebook is not the only people that use algorithms to create our news feed. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, even LinkedIn, they're all using algorithms that kind of control the messages that we see. So while you might think I'm hammering pretty hard on Facebook, they are certainly not the only people that are guilty of this. But what my whole presentation sort of revolves around is this, this idea of an information diet versus information junk food. And that's like one of the easiest ways that I can kind of explain what an echo chamber is and why it, it impacts us on a daily basis. Now, I know that this, the whole purpose of this is to talk about research that I've been doing. So I am going to talk about several specific studies that I took a look at in my research and try to share why those studies are so important. And then we can't have a presentation without offering some type of solution to the problem that we're currently in. So that's what I'm going to be covering today. And I know that we are probably at about, looking at about maybe 30 to 35 minutes, so I hope I don't go too fast. Um, but basically what I want to start off with is, is really the history of the internet. Maybe whether, you, yeah, we're going way back. I'm not sure whether you all know this or not, but the internet was created by our government and was actually around for a very long time before it was turned over into public hands. In fact, almost 30 years the internet was around before we as a society was actually able to use it. Um, so that caused some problems when it was first introduced. Um, but what I want to share with you is sort of the evolution of the internet over the past, let's just say, 30 years. When the internet was created in the, for, for uh, public use, not from the government, but for public use, there was something called Web 1.0. No one really ever called it that, but that's, as we look back, is what it was, Web 1.0. And all that was, was the internet was basically a repository for people to put up information whether that was you know, stories or, or movie trailers or whatever it was, you know, early podcasts, they weren't really called that back then either. But basically, it was a one-way form of communication, meaning that we would type in the web address, we would go to the web address, the website would give us information. There was no way to interact with that website. So it's also, this idea is very similar to like traditional media in that, when you're watching TV, you can't really communicate back with those people that are on that television program. Uh, of course, today, there are ways to interact. Sports is excellent interaction with uh, people that are watching the show. You can vote on polls or you can tweet to them and they'll run it across the bottom. But for, for my purposes in Web 1.0, think TV, think radio, and think billboards. You know, you see a billboard along the side of the road, you can't really interact with that billboard. It's a one-way form of communication. So this took place from 1989 to like the mid-1990s, maybe even the late 1990s. There was a major shift in the mid to late 90s that really changed the internet forever, and it was something called user-generated content, something that we do almost, almost every single day and really don't even realize it whether that's taking pictures of ourselves, taking video, creating podcasts, even just taking pictures of our surroundings, that's user-generated content. But for the first time in the late 1990s, we were able to interact with the websites. Now, this might be before some of your time, but does anybody remember what the first well-known social media platform was? MySpace. MySpace. And what's funny about MySpace, and I always get this when I talk about MySpace, is everyone chuckles about MySpace. Because MySpace was probably the most influential website in the history of the world. Because it created what we now know as social media. We look back and it was rudimentary and it wasn't really visually pleasing in the way that Facebook or Twitter or Instagram is. But it allowed us for the first time to create and to be creators. This is also about the same time that YouTube came to be, because YouTube is actually coming up pretty soon on their 20th anniversary. We've been able now to, with these devices that we all hold, create content, 
whether that's written in a blog form, whether that's audio in a podcast, or whether that's a, a picture or video. So for the first time in the late 90s, early 2000s, we were able to upload this user-generated content. Um, this is a two-way form of communication, much like the graphic I have there. The website, you can go to a website, you can get information, but then you can share that information with the website. Which really brings us to uh, the late 2000s, so really when Facebook and other social media channels really started taking off, which now brings us to Web 3.0. This is pretty much where we are today in terms of social media. So for the first time, these social media channels allow you to not only go to that website and get information, to upload information, pictures, video, podcasts, etc., but it also allows you to interact with other users. So I'm going to come right back to this slide, but I just want to sort of show you an example of what I mean. So assume that this is Facebook, and you go to Facebook. You're the website vid visitor, and you can interact with that website by uploading your user-generated content. You can get information from that website through news and other channels, other people who are sharing information, but then you can also, right here, interact with other people. I mean, think about it. How many people on a given day do we interact with on social media? Whether it's just liking or retweeting or commenting on the post, you're interacting with other people. So this is really kind of the shift that's happened over the years from a one-way form of communication where we just go to a website, get information, to a two-way where we can go and upload our user-generated content, to a three-way form of communication where not only are we interacting with the website, we can upload our user-generated content, we also can talk to other people. So that's really much uh, sort of a very, very quick history lesson on where we are with social media. But the question remains, well, what's that have to do with anything? Well, it has a lot to do with a lot of things. Let's just put it that way. I first want to start off with sharing what an echo chamber is. Basically, an echo chamber is a situation that your ideas or beliefs are reinforced by the information that you seek out. Naturally, as human beings, we subscribe to something called confirmation bias. And that is that often, I'm not certainly not all the time because that's what research is all about, Often, we are going to seek out information that conforms with what we believe. And I often use this example in class. I've taught so many public speaking classes, and I love that class. We always, at the end of that class, do a persuasive speech. And I would always have students that would want to debate things like abortion and you know, very, very hot button topics, very, very polarized topics. And I would never let a student do that. And I always got the question, well, well, why can't I do this? Why won't you let me do this as my per persuasive speech? And I would say, look, I don't care who you are. I don't care what credentials you have. If somebody in this audience is pro-choice and you're arguing pro-life, there is not one thing that you can say in seven to nine minutes that's going to change their mind. You could literally bring in the best doctor in the world. And if that person in the audience is pro-life, even that doctor with all his credentials and all his time in that field is not going to change your mind. Instead, you're going to gravitate to somebody, maybe just some guy walking down the hall, who might also be pro-life. And even if that person has no credentials, no medical background whatsoever, you're going to gravitate to that message because it's, a, it's something within you. Ever since we were little, we've been taught that we need to have an opinion on, on topics like abortion. I use that because that's often a very, it's either pro-life or pro-choice. But there are many, many other issues in our society that are also very similar. So why I bring this up is because social media is now providing that to us really without our knowledge. Um, so I kind of want to explain to you how that works. Facebook, and again, I want to point out it's not just Facebook. It's Twitter, it's Instagram, which don't know if you know this, Instagram is actually owned by Facebook. Twitter, Snapchat, and, and LinkedIn, and all other social media channels use an algorithm. Well, what's an algorithm? Well, we live in a personalized internet, which means that what Brian sees when he searches for something on Google is different than what I'm going to see when I search on Google. Or Christian, when he goes on Facebook, what his Facebook looks like is going to look way different than what my Facebook's going to look like. 
Twitter, and on down the line. Now, when Facebook was first created, they used an algorithm called edge rank. So the things that showed up in your newsfeed depended on one of three things. How recent the post was, how much people engaged with it, meaning like, comment, or share, and the previous interaction you've had with that person. I'll give you an example. If you start, let's say you have one really close friend, and, and they're you know, funny, and you like the things they post, and you like and comment on a lot of their, their stuff, you are going to see them in your feed much more than you would see almost anybody else. Okay? So this is why we see all of the things we do. The things that you see the most are things that are the most recent, the most engaged with, and depending on the previous interaction you've had with that individual. But edge rank has not been used on Facebook since 2011. So the question is, why is this happening to this point? Well, the bottom line was, the more people signed up for Facebook, the more brands that signed up for Facebook, the more news there was. When Facebook was first created, we saw almost everything in our news feed. But the more and more people signed up, the more space is at a premium. Which means there's a reason when you're scrolling through your Facebook or your Twitter or your Instagram, there's a reason why every single post that you see is there. Because space is at a premium. Now, because of that, now it's uh, small businesses, for example. I work with a lot of small businesses outside of my time here, and I consult with them about how to put together a social media campaign. Those individuals used to get 50% of the people that like their page to see each post. Now they're lucky if they get 5%. Well, the reason that is is because Facebook wants these businesses to pay for that space. And so these algorithms that are based on how recent, how much engagement there was, and how much previous interaction you have with that brand, that's how Facebook makes money. Because they've monetized that space, and they want businesses to pay for it. Now, as I mentioned, Edge Rank was abandoned in 2011. So your question now might be, well, OK, if that's not what they do anymore, well, what do they do? Well, really, to answer, no one really knows. There are some ideas, and to be honest with you, a lot of it still comes from these three things. However, the more and more Facebook's algorithm got more complex, along with Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn, they will not release this information. But here's a very interesting quote from uh, one of the sources that I used. Her name's uh, Sophia Bernazzi, and she's from HubSpot, which is a really awesome website. has to do with marketing, lots of opportunities to read some really cool blogs. This is something that she said. Unlike its predecessor, which was EdgeRank, which assigned a generic point value to post formats, the current algorithm adapts to individual user preferences. Now, what that means is, Every time you make a post, every single time, there is a score that's assigned to that post. And depending on how high your score is, is how many other people are going to see it. And I'll give you an example. Do you ever notice how if someone gets married, or if someone has a kid, and they share that on social media, that even if it's not someone you've engaged with for a while, or haven't talked to for a while, it's always in your timeline? Well, one of the reasons is, is that particular post scored very high. So every single time you go to log on, it takes all these thousands and thousands of posts that might show up in your feed, and what it does is it scores all of them. And based on that score those posts get is whether it shows up in your feed or not. So these algorithms are, are a necessity. Now, I know a lot of this might seem like I'm bashing social media. Social media is revolutionary. But it's only revolutionary if we understand what's going on and we understand how we are being manipulated. Because then we can kind of you know, go in a different direction. But the bottom line is, as I mentioned, all social media channels use these algorithms. It's not just Facebook. Facebook is not the only one guilty of this. Now, Facebook has a business model. And they make money in much the same way that other journalistic ventures make money as well, um, especially in today's day and age. One of the biggest issues that in my field that I've you know, identified over the, certainly not just me, all many people have, 
is that no one wants to pay for news anymore. I can't, you know, I would imagine very few of us still get the paper delivered to us. And even maybe fewer, fewer of us pay for an online subscription to a Penn Live or to a Washington Post or to a New York Times. So now what those organizations have had to do is monetize their space, which is exactly what Facebook does. Facebook has to monetize their space because we don't want to pay for it. Wouldn't it be great if someone would say, hey, pay a dollar a month for Facebook because as an aside, Facebook makes on average about $12 a year for all of us. Every person that's on Facebook averages about 12 bucks a year. Wouldn't it be great if we could pay a dollar a month for Facebook and never have to see any ads and see the stuff that we wanted to see, but also see other things that maybe we hadn't thought of? We don't pay in money for Facebook, but instead what we pay is our entire, everything about us, our identity. Facebook knows everything about us. There are at least 125 data points that Facebook collects on us, and it goes way beyond what you provide to them. Many of us provide our occupation, when we were born, our relationship status, and other things that you know, we share with them willingly. There's a lot of things that we don't share with them willingly that have a lot to do with who Facebook thinks we are. Um, this is actually where a lot of my research actually went into, and I'm not going to be able to talk a whole lot about it. But to me, one of our biggest concerns about social media is, is the privacy aspect. Every time we see these terms and conditions, when we download a new app, what do we do? Okay. Meanwhile, <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, they're, they're using this information against us, really, to try to find out what we want to know. And I guess, you know, on the surface, you might think, well, who cares? I, I want I wanna, a, you know, a feed where it's the stuff that I'm interested in. But the problem with that, and the biggest issue in terms of what we try to teach our students here, and, and certainly in our department, and in many other departments as well, is we can't just report on what our audience wants to know. We have to report on what they need to know. And this is where Facebook and other social media channels really are missing the boat. Because all they care about, they don't care, listen, they don't care anything about us. All they care about is that we keep scrolling, and that they can keep serving us ads. So they don't want to give us information that doesn't conform to what we believe in. So if we're pro-life, and we see a pro-choice news article, we might get off Facebook, because we don't even want to hear that. And that's what Facebook doesn't want, because the only way they make money is if you stay on longer, so they can keep serving you ads. It's almost just like on a, a, a television station. Their whole mission in life is to get you not to switch the channel, because the more reach they have, the more number of viewers, the more ads they serve, the more money they can charge for those ads. Same type of thing. So while social media is relatively new technology, much of it is exactly like television, radio, you know, more legacy type of media in how they make money. Another big part of my research has to do with our political views. And certainly in our climate right now and, and the time I have, I'm not even going to try to get into that too much. But one thing that Facebook does is they create a persona of you. And based on the posts that you like or read, because everything you click on in Facebook and go to, they log that to. So anytime you read an article, Facebook will remember that. They know, or they think they know, what political affiliation you are. So whether, depending on things you write, things you like, websites you visit, they are developing. I think that Bill, because he went to this particular website, is a Democrat. And then they're going to start serving you maybe a little bit more democratically slanted news, vice versa with Republicans. Um, Julia Glum was well, from a great article that I read in Time Magazine. Um, she says that she, she kind of used a, a metaphor in that Facebook is not a social media channel the way we believe, but instead what they are is the world's largest marketing agency with the ability to find people that are Republican or Democrat, old or young, 
single, married, divorced, all in between. And so if you have a product and you know who you want to market to, you very easily can go in, type a few things, and your, your message is in front of those people. So it's unbelievable that 1.15 billion people log into Facebook each and every day. And many, many more are over 2 billion are average monthly users. So while Facebook might be considered revolutionary, which it is, what it also is, is the world's largest marketing agency, getting rich off of all of our information. And we really have nothing we can do about it. Well, maybe not quite nothing. Now, again, a lot of what my research talks about in, in the paper that I did has to do with how our news is slanted. And again, at, only at a basic level, I hope that you kind of understand that, you know, if we look at two news organizations, CNN and Fox News, CNN often very democratically slanted, Fox News often slanted toward the Republican viewpoint. There's a lot more to this. Almost every news organization is slightly slanted in some fashion. And it's not necessarily with the opinions that are on there, although in these two cases that often is the case. It's often by something where it, it's, what stories are they talking about? What information do they include in, these, in the articles or these opinion pieces that they're giving? So unfortunately, I can't, I'm not gonna go into this all that much, other than to just point out that almost any news source that we watch, that we look at, view, read, listen to, they're all biased in some way or another. Now certainly some much, much more than others. But social media, so I, that's kind of what a lot of people say about this is, well, if that's the case, and all the news we see is slanted, then who cares if it's slanted on social media? Well, this is why. If we're watching Fox News, we have the choice to let it on or to turn the station and go somewhere else. If we're watching CNN, same thing happens. When we're on social media, we don't have that choice. And in fact, an algorithm is deciding for us what ends up in our newsfeed. Now certainly, there are people that get their news by seeking it out themselves. But even Google is just as guilty as Facebook, Twitter, and other social media channels of, again, so I made this point earlier, what Brian searches on Google, even if we use the same search terms, is gonna be different than what, what shows up in my Google searches. So even if we try to find and seek out our own news, it's still nearly impossible to get a good you know, representation of both sides. We also don't get to cho choose what shows up in our newsfeed. The information, the news that we get is predetermined from an algorithm based on who Facebook thinks we are. But how accurate do you think that that is? And do you think that there's room for major errors in that algorithm? Because it's not a human being determining what's showing up in there, it's an algorithm. Um, a gentleman that is sort of the, the person that kind of started this whole thing is a gentleman named Eli Pariser. And I would, I would love if you guys would, maybe after this, if this is something you're interested in, go watch his TED Talk. And it's called The Social Media Filter Bubble. Uh, and he talks about a really important concept that I want to chat with you about right now. Um, but Pariser, uh, in this, his whole discussion was about Google and how our Google searches differ between person to person. Interestingly enough, in one of my classes I had last term, I had everybody do Google searches for the exact same terms and saw what certain people's Google search uh, results showed up as. And let me tell you, everyone was blown away because there was almost no one that had similar search results. Because we live in an age of the internet being personalized, which is fine on one hand, but it's really a problem on the other. And this is what I mean. So earlier, I talked about information diet versus information junk food. And I use this as an example. I love chocolate cake. Love chocolate cake, as I mean, I would literally, if I could, if I didn't have to worry about keeping my figure, I would, I would eat chocolate cake at every meal. I love it so much. The bottom line is, I also have to weigh 
that chocolate cake, that want for a sweet treat, with my health and you know my the way I look. And I love to play sports. And if I eat a ton of chocolate cake, that probably makes things a much more difficult. So many of you who run into me in the staff lounge notice what I eat for lunch every day. Steve, what do I typically eat for lunch every day? It's usually something that's pretty healthy. <laughs> and and often it's a salad. And it's, not, it's not frozen foods. <laughs> so we have to weigh for our health, for our physical health, whether we want a salad, which, hey, salads can be good, but not, a, not one salad is as good as a piece of chocolate cake. It's just not. Now, why I use this as an example is because traditional news is like a salad. Our newspapers, our news organizations, that provide us not only what we want to know, but what we need to know. That is our information diet. We get, so you know, a traditional newspaper comes in multiple sections. Now certainly you can choose to read certain sections, but at least that information is there for you. Information junk food, on the other hand, is social media. Because all social media cares about, any channel, doesn't matter which one, I know I'm being hard on Facebook here, but any channel, it's just like information junk food. Because it's giving us what we want over and over and over, and it doesn't care what the repercussions of that are. So when you think about social media in terms of how we collect our news, I want you to think about this. Because this idea of the information diet versus the information junk food is really at the heart of everything about the echo chamber. Now, um, I do want to end with just a couple of the studies that I looked at. Um, and of course, I'm only just scratching the surface here. My paper here ended up being about between, I don't know, 22 pages, 23 pages, something along those lines. But this is something that I intend on continuing to study, continuing to research, and even in my interview with uh, my PhD panel to get in, this was something that I'm already considering maybe using as a dissertation topic in a few years. Obviously, there'll be some more research between now and then. But there was a couple of really important studies that I keyed in on, and this was probably one of the most important. And it had to do with how we get our news in 2018. So this was a Pew Research study that just came out last year. This was for 2017, probably a little too early in the year for the 2018 results, that said that 68% of those surveyed received at least some of their news from social media, and that 43% got all of their news from social media. That scares me, because when all we are presented with is information junk food, and any of you, I know many of you that are in class know I pick on this guy a lot, but to be honest, who really cares what Justin Bieber's doing? <laughs> Honestly, that's part of this information junk food. We keep getting news put at us that really doesn't matter, and frankly, in a democratic society, we really shouldn't even care all that much about. Now, I'm as big a sports fan as anyone, but that also can equate to information junk food, because it's not and doesn't help progress our society in any way. Um, this is also very interesting, and this is why Facebook is, is probably the most guilty here, is Facebook contributed to 43% of the news from their respondents, which means that Facebook was the main way the people who got their news from social media got their news. And when an algorithm is controlling the news we see based on what they know we want to see, they don't address what we need to see. And that is part of the reason that I believe that there is voter apathy. Our voter turnout is consistently less than 50%. And even in you know, non-presidential elections, it's often much, much lower. I'm teaching a media and politics class right now, and I was so sad. First day of class, I took a little poll and asked if anybody had voted. And only like three of my students had voted before. And I believe that this echo chamber contributes to that. Not only that, it's continued to increase how much difference we perceive we all are from one another. You know, 
probably about five years ago, I would argue that 80% of us were centrists, meaning maybe we were a little on the Democratic side, maybe a little on the left, maybe we were a little on the Republican side, a little on the right, but we could usually come to some kind of middle ground. You're always going to have your much, much more conservative or liberal. But because of social media, because we're only being presented with certain information, we are moving much, much farther away from the center, and now we're all collecting sort of out here on the fringes. In fact, this was honestly one of the most important studies that I took a look at. And what it talked about was after the 2016 election, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, they were asking about people and how they dealt with others who didn't agree with them politically. 13% of the study either blocked or unfollowed people that didn't believe the same way that they did. Now, we don't have to raise our hands, but may we have been guilty of the same thing. Maybe if we were a Hillary Clinton supporter, maybe if we had one of our friends who supported Trump, maybe we just unfollowed them. Or vice versa. If we were a Trump fan, maybe we saw somebody who was a Hillary fan and we just unfollowed them. 13% of the people in Cox and Jones' study in 2016 said that that was the case. What's worse, 24% of Democrats unfollowed people that believed in Donald Trump. Now, maybe it was just because he was so boisterous and bold in the things he was saying that people unfollowed, but this is a very disturbing trend. Because what I'm arguing is that I think Facebook should really understand that it is a journalistic entity, that it is a journalistic enterprise in the same way that the New York Times or Washington Post is, and that they need to take responsibility. But what they can't do is take responsibility for our own ignorance. If we want to create these echo chambers for ourselves, there's nothing that Facebook can do. So I guess what I'm asking you is to consider some things that you might be able to do to change this. Because look, social media is not going anywhere, these algorithms aren't going anywhere, and slanted news isn't going anywhere. But as a citizenry, what we can do is understand a few things that we might be able to do to kind of combat this. Number one, I think Facebook has a duty to understand that it is a journalistic enterprise, which they have come out and said that they are not. The studies show otherwise. When nearly half of the population is getting all of their news from social media, they have to understand that they are a journalistic enterprise the same way as Penn Live, Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, The LA Times, and right on down the list. They need to have contrasting views. They cannot continue to only show us one side of the story, especially when it's about important things that we need to vote on and we need to be properly educated about. So that's the first. The second, they need to be more transparent and take much more responsibility for the information that they collect on us. Because the bottom line is, what they collect about us it's really not fair to us, because we can either opt in or opt out. Either we opt in and we use it, or we opt out and we don't. Which goes back to the element of choice. Earlier you might have thought to yourself, well wait, why can't I just choose whether or not to use this? Why can't I just choose whether or not to be on Facebook or Twitter? Well, I happen to have a 16-year-old daughter who is obsessed with Instagram and Snapchat in the same way many other young people are. Why don't you ask her if she has a choice to be on those social media platforms? Because she doesn't. It's just part of the social norms that now exist in our society. So when, when you say, hey, I can choose to be on Facebook or not, well, maybe some of us in this room can, and maybe some of us in this room decided we don't want to be on social media. But the younger generation doesn't have that choice. And last, Facebook has got to understand that they are a journalistic enterprise and they have to abide by the journalistic ethics and the canons of journalism that we train our future journalists in you know, our communications program to be. Being impartial, being unbiased, and understanding that to be a journalist, you have to cover both sides of the story. So I want to leave you with this. 
Jeffrey Fowler of the Wall Street Journal, in one of the other sources that I use for my research, said this. Facebook isn't to blame for ignorant commentators or closed minds. They've been around as long as there has been news. But it can no longer shrug off its accountability for its invisible hand on the news. Facebook and other social media channels need to step up and understand what they're doing to our country. But we also have the duty to seek out more than one news source. We cannot just read one news source and agree with that. We have to read a combination of news sources and make our own opinions. So as you leave today, I want you to think about that. The next time that you read a news source about something important to you, don't just read one, read two, read three, read four. Make your own mind up. Don't let the media make your mind up for you. Thank you.